Picture it now. It's the late 2000s. You've had a long day from learning at school, or maybe it was the weekend and you've been playing your Nintendo DS and online flash games. You get in front of the TV and your favorite Disney movie is in the DVD player. This Disney DVD is enhanced with Disney's Fast Play. That is Tinkerbell. But you probably already knew that if that jingle is ingrained into your head like it is mine. She's always been one of Disney's most iconic characters since her debut in 1953. Fairies are magical creatures that represent childhood joy and whimsy, and they've been ever present in pop culture. In the early 2000s, Tinkerbell's popularity allowed her to lead her very own multimedia franchise, the Disney Fairies, that followed her and fairy friends' journeys around Pixie Hollow. The series is well remembered for its six straight-to-DVD animated movies, but it encompassed a whole world of books, merchandising, an online game, and a whole world of lore to discover. So let me take you on a deep dive through the Disney fairies. From cancelled movies, huge losses of money for Disney, the surprising history of the franchise and its forgotten fairies, and of course a look at all of the Tinkerbell movies and their chaotic world. So let us begin. <laughs> First, a history lesson. The journey begins in 2005. YouTube had just been launched, the icon of cinema, Barbie Fairytopia was released, and I was born. Around this point, Disney's consumer products division had begun the Disney Princess brand. Despite the first princess movie being from the 1930s, it wasn't until the 2000s that the concept came of a Disney princess in the sparkly pink liminal void under one series but also completely separate. The Disney princesses are kind of weird. Wanting to dig deeper into this market of young girls, they thought of a few ideas to make new franchises, like Disney mermaids, focusing on Ariel and friends, but eventually chose Tinkerbell. Only this time, instead of grouping existing characters together, they had to create a whole new world. And thus, Disney fairies came about. The aim was to be multimedia, so that the franchise could exist across films, games, and books that entice you to buy lots and lots and lots of Disney fairies merchandise. <sighs> okay, so I'm going to divide this into two generations, aptly titled Generation 1, and Generation 2. Even though the first film wouldn't release until 2008, there's a whole era of this franchise that I feel like only a select few of us remember. So you probably remember the characters like Fawn and Rosetta and Silvermist, but those characters were only introduced in Generation 2, but in Generation 1 there was a completely different lineup of characters. In August of 2005, the first book would be released titled Fairy Dust and the Quest for the Egg and launched Generation 1. The novel was written by an author called Gail Carson Levine, and in it a new fairy, Prilla, is born, but is upset to find she doesn't have a fairy talent. Pixie Hollow is then hit with a hurricane, and an important magical egg that keeps Neverland afloat is shattered, so Prilla is ordered by the Queen, alongside fairies Vidya and Rani, to undergo a huge journey to restore the egg and keep Neverland intact. The thing I absolutely love about this book is how pretty the art direction is. Um, if my bedroom wasn't evident, uh, I kind of love the whole fairy core aesthetic, I guess, and just anything that's whimsical and magical. And through the first few years that this franchise existed, it's it's really nostalgic and it's really 2000s, but it's also like otherworldly and fantastical. Um, it just really captures that magic of escaping to the fantasy like fairy worlds with all of its concepts. <sighs> okay. Let us begin attempting to explain and establish the rules for this universe. A new fairy is born and transported to Pixie Hollow every time a baby laughs for the first time. Pixie Hollow is at the heart of Neverland, where all the Never Fairies are. Um, it's also worth noting that Never Fairies are not the only fairies to exist, but they're the only ones ever detailed across this whole franchise. Also, Sparrowman is the word given to a male fairy. Every fairy has a talent. This is, I guess, how jobs work in the fairy economy. A fairy will instantly know and announce their talent upon arrival in Pixie Hollow. Examples are fast flying fairies, art fairies, cleaning, cooking, etc. But also things like water, light and frost fairies. Tinkerbell herself is a pots and pans talent fairy, which would later be named to a tinkering talent. So basically she fixes things and crafts things like that. Some of these talents are a little bit out there, like 
Knowing when a dish is done, fairy, um, all I can say is I would get kind of mad if that was my talent. The human world is forbidden. Humans are called clumsies by the fairies. Fairies also have a different language. Um, they're not allowed to say the words sorry or goodbye as an example and they have their own little leaf themed alphabet. Mother Dove and the history of Pixie Hollow. So basically there is this dove in Pixie Hollow who is essentially a godly figure to the fairies. Um, so before the fairies found her, they lived separate from Neverland through a portal behind a waterfall with a pixie dust tree. But there was a Neverland fairy pixie hollow war. Intense, I know. This destroyed their tree, which produced their pixie dust. But eventually the fairies found Mother Dove and the home tree, which is where they all live now. I'm meeting all the fairies in pixie hollow learning their talents and exploring their world. Each one has a story, and you can meet them too. Meet the forgotten Disney fairies that have kind of become lost to time. In generation one, there are eight main fairies. Tinkerbell is the main character we all know. A lot of people tend to forget how sassy and evil the original Tinkerbell was. As she became a mascot for this franchise, that was eventually sanitized, but she does still have a very short temper. Lily is a gardening fairy. She is patient and nurturing, and she has one of the best outfits. Her hat is really cute. Beck is an animal fairy who supposedly loves acorn pancakes, furry creatures, and playing hide and seek. I love, love, love her doll with her little boots and her freckles, Um, but I feel like it doesn't look much like the artwork and I prefer the design of the doll. Prilla is the newest fairy. She initially doesn't have a talent which kind of confuses everyone and confuses herself, but she grows to find that she has a unique clapping talent which lets her have these visions of the human world to encourage children to believe in fairies. Every time a child stops believing, a fairy dies. So Mother Dove has this egg that so long as it's kept warm everyone in Neverland stays young forever but just because you don't grow up doesn't mean you can't die and the main cause of fairy death is a child giving up their belief. From books and magazines you would also get to see all the fairies bedrooms which I want to live in all of these. Fira is a light fairy and she's very energetic and confident. I love her hair, she's really really pretty. Um, in general all of the girls are different and diverse from one another which I really like. Bess is a messy art talent fairy who loves tulips and dreams of mermaids. Mermaids were actually quite common to appear in the books and stuff which I really wish we got to see in the movies more. Bess also hosts art lessons in one of the books for a new fairy called Scarlet who is not a core character or anything but I love her for some reason and I need to mention her. Rani is the it girl of Pixie Hollow. Uh, at least in my opinion anyways. She is a water talent fairy. She always finishes other sentences and tends to cry a lot, but I feel like she's a popular figure. She likes to plan all of the fairy events and parties, of which there are a lot. She is the only fairy without wings, seeing as she gave them up to save Neverland, which lets her swim despite the general rule being that fairies can't. Rani feels very ethereal and magical. <laughs> And lastly is Vidya. She is kind of the villain, or at least the mean girl. She is a fast flying fairy. She wants to feel better than everyone else and she has a very patronizing way of speaking. And she doesn't live in the home tree like all the other fairies. So, um, here she is. Besides obviously Tinkerbell, she's the only fairy to exist across both generations. So I thought it was fitting that she was the one I got. Um, she was also the only one I could find. She also has a broken wing, so you can blame the eBay seller for that one. Her face is kind of giving like brats. Does anyone see that? Like, she has a really sharp jawline too. Oh my God, she has Alexandria's Genesis. She is really cute though. I'm not a doll reviewer, that is not the energy here, but, but you know, I can't do a deep dive on the Disney fairies without getting at least one of the fairy dolls. So yeah, this was Vidya. She also, this isn't her original hairstyle because whoever sold it to me again, it was messed up, but this is all the budget can afford right now. So subscribe if 
beyond improvements, I don't know. The early logo, packaging and merchandise for Disney Furries feels very nostalgic. I dug up these old commercials for the toys and it really feels like transporting to this nostalgic time that has passed us. They really went in on all this merchandising. It's so interesting to see the way Disney kind of built up this franchise and made it its own thing. Some of my personal favourites I came across are these mini plush with zip-up felt fairy houses and the pixie hideaway playsets that had secret compartments and accessories. For the first few years of its existence, Disney fairies would continue to exist throughout other books. The same author would eventually release sequels in 2007 and 2010, but there were a huge series of chapter books that acted as episodic stories focusing on different fairies that explored the characters, Pixie Hollow and Neverland as a whole accessible for kids. For example, one focused on Rani leaving Pixie Hollow to a mermaid lagoon, one where everyone is asking Bess for a painting, and one where Prilla has to herd a group of butterflies. This book, which I obviously only got for research purposes, lays out all of the knowledge and lore about how Pixie Hollow works and all of the fairies. I started really getting a feel for life in Pixie Hollow. From their food recipes and menus, the ways of fairy hygiene and cleanliness, fairy clothes and fairy sewing, natural fairy remedies and medicine, fairy games and activities. When I was little, I loved worlds and series like this that had their own kind of logic and inner workings that I could just engross myself in and escape to. Especially with a concept like fairies, there's so much to be explored and I do have a soft spot for the movies, but when you look through stuff like this, it kind of makes you realise there was a lot that was left out of the movies or just not explored as much. But of course, we will get into all of that later. Let's finish by taking a look through the nostalgic world of the old Disney Fairies website. It opens up with a pixelated animatic introducing Pixie Hollow before letting you see character profiles, read a snippet of the first book, play a few mini games and download desktop wallpapers. I love looking at these kind of older interactive internet websites that advertised kids media through games and activities before social media took over. The only games were a crossword and a drag and click light mini game. It advertises a feature where you can create your own fairy but is marked off as coming soon, which I assume developed into Pixie Hollow Online, a rabbit hole we'll delve into later. While making this video, I've just loved scrolling through Pinterest and finding artwork from this era, from the books, the magazines, the promotional material. There's also a lot of really nice concept art from when the series was being developed, which is all being archived on this Tumblr blog. After the movies started coming out, this era of the franchise became a lost relic. I never really read these books growing up, but now I've grown weirdly attached and nostalgic for them. Let me know if you've read any of the books or have any memories of the early days of Disney fairies. Um, let me know your thoughts or experiences with this era in the comments. In 2007 to 2008, the brand shifted into Generation 2 as work began on the Tinkerbell feature films. Tinkerbell, an all new movie. Do you remember when Disney were pumping out straight-to-video sequels for every movie under the sun from Beauty and the Beast to Brother Bear? Basically, Disney would use their subsidiary animation studio Disney Toon to rapidly produce these sequels with much, much smaller budgets. Even though they're mostly considered flops by critics, they proved incredibly financially successful. The first release sold over 1.5 million copies in its first two days, eventually grossing over $300 million on a $5 million budget. Disney Toon had been joined by Disney Consumer Products in the 2000s. If you remember, this is the division responsible for Disney fairies as a property, and they made plans for a Tinkerbell origin film to drive merchandise sales and expand the franchise. But Disney... <sighs> Disney were going through it at this time, and there was a very troubled journey to the big screen. When Disney bought Pixar, the chief creative officer of Pixar also became the head of Disney Animation, and he was not happy with Disney's little sequel machine and called for major reforms and cancellations. Consequently, 
Tinkerbell was a part of this and had to be delayed after an extremely troubled production. This film had supposedly gone through two dozen rewrites, many shifts in director, and a report from higher ups had argued it was virtually unwatchable, so they had to scrap upwards of 30 million dollars in animation. Okay, not to like drag on about useless Disney fairies information, but I think this is generally interesting. Back in Generation 1, an interactive DVD was released, with games and these like audiobooks with accompanying visuals. On the DVD was a teaser for an upcoming Tinkerbell movie. There were also early versions of the trailers on other DVDs and leaks showing that the title was originally Tinkerbell and the Ring of Belief. The Ring of Belief is essentially the idea of children's belief in fairies keeping them alive. Allegedly, this was a much more ambitious draft of the film and featured Tinkerbell meeting Peter Pan. Brittany Murphy was originally cast as the voice for Tinkerbell and it had a slightly different art style, but eventually this was all changed and the film was scrapped. Eventually, as the film was reworked, so began Generation 2, as Disney shifted all of their branding and merchandise to match the characters and style from the upcoming film. In 2008, the final product and the first movie, simply titled Tinkerbell would be released. First of all, the art direction and animation is beautiful and reflects the same woodland aesthetic and magical fairy world that I loved. Even though these weren't theatrical, it's surprisingly up to that kind of standard. The decision to animate in CGI makes sense for a restrictive budget and allows it to be translated into dolls and figures and reused easily across mediums. I do slightly prefer the original art style it had planned, even if the differences are subtle. This is an origin story that starts with Tink's arrival to Pixie Hollow and the discovery of her talent and an exploration of Pixie Hollow. A lot of the marketing for this film advertised it as this hidden story and origin behind Tinkerbell, but the film is more about self-discovery and a personal journey than swashbuckling action. Tinkerbell then meets her new friends in Pixie Hollow. Silver Mist is a water fairy, voiced by Lucy Liu. These films ended up having quite an impressive voice cast. Um, they really went off on Tinkerbell 2008 of all things. I love Silver Mist's design, she's just a sweet character. Nowadays, or at least whenever I see people talking about this franchise, she's remembered as a fan favourite character, and I see why. Rosetta is a garden fairy, voiced by Kristen Chenoweth. She is a diva, she's that girl that doesn't want to get mucky and she's described as being the oldest out of the girls. Ages are kind of vague in this world. Obviously fairies don't grow up, but when they're born, they're already adults. And looking at characters like Queen Clarion, it seems like there are visual differences between ages. Iridessa is next, a light fairy voiced by Disney Channel's Raven Simone, the more anxious and timid fairy. And lastly, Fawn, who had three different voice actors. Clearly, none of them were that attached to the character. She is an animal fairy, I think. Maybe she's supposed to be the tomboy when really she just likes to be mischievous and is kind of quirky and energetic. The chapter book series would continue into the early 2010s and would feature overlap of book and movie characters, but generally as the movie came out, the franchise shifted into Generation 2 and these were its new fairies. At first, in theory, this is kind of random, but it actually starts to make a lot of sense. First off, there were just too many of them. Eight characters is far too many to adequately develop in a film and it would be too crowded. As it is, the new characters got very few lines in this film in the first place. Secondly, unless you were directly adapting the book, stories like Prilla's and Rani's were kind of difficult to explain. The characters' style and fashion is also a lot more streamlined and simple in the new characters, which was likely more beneficial for an animation and marketing standpoint. I wish the original characters appeared in any of these films, but they never did, so we have to say goodbye to them. The title Tinkerbell was not a lie, because these girls 
really do not have much to do initially, but they still got their places in the official lineup. This way, young fans could choose their favorite, take online which Disney fairy are you quizzes, and buy full sets of dolls. Let me know who was your favorite as a kid or who your favorite is now. Um, I love Iridessa because she's kind of shy and anxious like me in real life. As the film progresses, Tinkerbell starts to believe tinkering isn't a valuable enough talent to have. The fact that it's literally her name makes this kind of sad. So she spends a portion of the movie trying different things with the other fairies instead of tinkering, but she finds she is not so good at those and ends up destroying all the preparations for spring. Fairies control the change in season. This movie adds this idea to the lore and we'll see this setup used with little montages changing the seasons at the start of every film. However, this movie also brings into question whether or not the lore is entirely consistent. For one, where is Mother Dove? She is nowhere to be seen. And every new fairy is supposed to visit Mother Dove, but Tinkerbell doesn't. In general, we just don't see a lot of continuity between the books, so who knows if it's even in the same universe. Of course, by the end, she accepts herself and the value of her talent, and all is well and happy. Mae Whitman lends her voice to Tink and is now synonymous with the fairy, and she does a nice characterization. The film is cute overall. It's decent, it has some nice music, pretty animations, and it does a serviceable job at bringing fairies to the third dimension. Also, I don't know where to put this, but I love this little hamster guy called Cheese. Um, I'm obsessed with him. Cheese, my king. I love you. Okay, Tinkerbell movie tier list. This is going in A for a Tinkerbell film that is cute and does its job. Before we go into the next film, if you are enjoying the video, please leave a like. This is my first video here, so um, we're on a bit of a journey. Uh, any amount of support is really appreciated. I'm here to look at nostalgic movies and TV and games and series, um, internet culture, all that kind of stuff. So if any of that interests you or you've just been enjoying the video so far, please, please subscribe so you won't miss when I next upload. An origin story would only scratch the surface when it came to making movies with Tinkerbell. A year later, Tinkerbell and the Lost Treasure was released. This film is the one that didn't stick out in my memory as much as the rest. I really had to remember what the plot was. It takes place during the transition to autumn. Like I said, they all start with these opening sequences and each have these disembodied songs accompanying. This one also had a promotional single with Demi Lovato and I feel like the music video to this is such a relic of time and something the world really needs to remember. The plot of this film is that there's this moonstone that the fairies need to keep pixie dust production afloat and the queen tasks Tink to create a scepter for it, but... She then finds out about this ancient mirror that grants wishes and goes off on her hot air balloon adventure to find it, but then wastes the wish and eventually reconciles with a new scepter of the fragmented pieces. Pixie dust is produced by magical trees and is what allows the fairies to fly. Pixie dust trees are fueled by blue pixie dust, which only comes during a special event called the Blue Harvest Moon. When the moon's light shines on the moonstone that they're searching for in this film. I was kind of confused by this while watching it, but I think that's how it works. Terence is a sparrow man who was a character in Generation 1 and is brought over here too. This film focuses a lot on his dynamic with Tink, likely pushing for shipping culture, but really I don't get much romantic chemistry. In the books, he is like hardcore obsessed with Tink and writes poetry about her. His initial design was funky and cool. I, I do like him in the film, but Tinkerbell does not need a love interest. It's also disappointing that her friends are basically non-factors again. These trolls also really creep me out. This movie was not afraid to highlight Tink's temper though, which I think is actually important because in these girl-targeted media franchises, we don't always see flawed female characters, so it's nice to see that represented. Being autumn, this film also has a nice aesthetic and all the fairies get their warmer redesigns. The focus on tinkering gives it creative opportunities and the house is all look cute, but there's an endless world of opportunities throughout Neverlands that they refuse to explore, or even just in Pixie Hollow itself. This was the generation that I remember from growing up. 
but the movies feel a little bit restricted at exploring the world and using creative ideas. They have a really nice cozy feeling, I just think maybe there were some missed opportunities. They start to feel a little bit samey and blurred together. This was definitely the worst offender and the least memorable, even if it is a pleasant and comforting watch. And on our Tinkerbell movie tier list, this is going in L for leaving me wanting a little bit more but having a lot of sweet character moments. I don't really do mud. But you're a garden fairy! <laughs> I'm on a kid in it. 2010, Tinkerbell and the Great Fairy Rescue. This was the one I think I first watched when I was younger. It involves Tinkerbell going out into the mainland and becoming intrigued by this human girl who builds a fairy house that Tink is trapped in. And we follow the two trying to communicate and the relationship they build. Meanwhile, the other fairies are on a sort of rescue mission, but it's raining, meaning they can't fly. This one takes place during summer, but hear me out. It kind of feels like a Christmas movie. It has the plot of basically every Christmas movie ever. It has the busy parent who doesn't believe in something important to their child, who is adamant it's real, only this time it's fairies and not Santa. And of course, in the film's universe, the child was right and this fantastical thing actually exists. By the end, Tink uses pixie dust and teaches her how to fly, an obvious parallel to Peter Pan, which was sweet. Great Fairy Rescue has some nice ideas. It was interesting to explore for the clumsies, even if they never refer to them as that. The new setting provides a change of pace, the cottage and the arts and crafts aesthetic is pretty, but out of everywhere in Neverland, we choose to go out of Neverland. What I like most is that there's a B-plot of Tink's friends, because they each get a moment to shine. This is also where Vidya gets her redemption arc, and basically becomes the sixth girl of the lineup. Also, my queen, Bridget Mendler, had a song in this movie, so go her. Now, the timeline of events is kind of confusing, because from now on, Vidya gets along with everyone. So here, Tinkerbell is pretty new to Pixie Hollow. So why is it that in Generation 1, Vidya is still really nasty? Already, it's kind of confusing because where are characters like Rani and Bess during the events of these films? They're Tinkerbell's friends, right? But then these four girls are Tinkerbell's besties. Does she have two friend groups? Do they never overlap? Is she friends with Vidya? Is she friends with Peter Pan? Like, why is he in all of this? My conclusion is that even though it was released later, the films and all of Generation 2 start the timeline. This is where Tinkerbell is born and becomes accustomed to fairy life. We will get to this film, but in The Pirate Fairy, which was the fifth film, there appears younger versions of characters from the Peter Pan film, so we can assume that, and thus all of the other films, take place before then. But in text from Generation 1, there are references made to Peter Pan, specifically about Tink getting her heart broken by him when he falls for Wendy. And that is the plot of Peter Pan the film, so we can assume that Generation 1 takes place way after the fact, at the end of the timeline. For this to make sense, someone between the end of Generation 1 and the start of Generation 2, Tinker becomes partners with Peter, breaks off this partnership, Vidya enters her nasty era again, and then the timeline would all make sense. Maybe that, or maybe these are alternate universes, maybe there's a fairy multiverse. I don't know, maybe that, or maybe this is a children's series and they just went with whatever ideas they wanted and there's not a clear timeline, but, but why would I be if not over-analyzing pieces of media? Great Fairy Rescue is going in C for Clumsy. We're now three movies in, we've established this world and the franchise was becoming very successful. In 2013, the franchise was valued at $435 million, and what this franchise was really about was merchandising. Keep clean with fairy shower gel. Maybe use your fairy body lotion afterwards. Why don't you dry off with a fairy towel and spritz your fairy over your toilette? Get dressed in fairy t-shirts and skirts, or why don't you dress up as your favourite fairy characters and top it off with fairy trainers? Add these fairy pins to your collection, create your own fairy memory store and make friendship bracelets with fairy beads. Fairy plates, balloons and wrapping paper so you can have your own fairy themed party where you and your friends can play with all your fairy dolls. The first dolls from Generation 2 were released a year earlier than the movie because of all of the delays. They also had a playset of Tinkerbell's house, true to size mini dolls and a plush doll of every character. There's these kind of creepy looking dolls that look like Bratz babies and a ton of mini play sets including this beautiful toy of cheese.
Your wings, they're sparkling. Sticking to the theme of traveling across seasons, in 2012, the fourth film, Secret of the Wings, released to DVD. This film is interesting because even though it was a home video release in the US like normal, in some other regions it was released theatrically. It was also the first film to ditch the Tinkerbell and titling, which kind of coincided with each of them becoming a little bit more unique and distinct. It follows Tink's intrigue to the elusive Winter Woods, the frosty wonderland of Pixie Hollow. Only as a warm fairy, she can't enter, just as winter fairies can't enter the warm land. Something's telling me that this should be added to the list of lore, but I'm genuinely struggling to understand and justify this with the rest of the series. We literally see this not being a thing in the first film. What makes even less sense is that Tinkerbell actually has a twin sister. Meet Periwinkle, a frost fairy born of the same laugh as Tink. She meets Periwinkle after travelling to the Winter Woods rebelliously, and the two have this indescribable kind of connection. See, Perry now wants to visit the Warm Land, but likewise, she can't. This is the Frozen of the Tinkerbell films, focusing on friendship and love between sisters, winter powers, a world becoming more frosty over time, and a tragic event fixed by sisterly love at the end. Who do you think did it better? I think this is cute. The Winter Woods was a change of pace and it's nice to see new characters. Secret of the Wings had one of the bigger impacts. It's a film I see brought up or remembered more. If anyone out there is like a fan of these movies, I feel like they really like this one. Debbie Ryan voice this is a fairy called Spike. The animation is still lovely. Um, M for makes no sense, but I kind of love it anyways. On the DVD of this one was a 22 minute special called Pixie Hollow Games that aired on Disney Channel. It's fun, I like that we explored characters outside of Tinkerbell. This also seems like an appropriate time to talk about the many Pixie previews released in succession with all of the films. A long series of shorts with small stories and slapstick comedy. A grand total of 46 exist on YouTube or DVD bonus features. <sighs> wow, there was so much content released for this franchise. Your plan worked perfectly, Captain. <laughs> Captain. In the spring of 2014, one of the most unique films in the franchise, The Pirate Fairy, releases. This film is so much fun. It really started to take more risks and do its own thing. To establish, there are a few things that the books did from the start that the movies never did. One of these is that the movies do not mention the rest of Neverland practically ever. I've already kind of spoken about this when trying to explain the timeline. So for all we know, Peter Pan didn't really exist, there's no mermaids, there's no lost boys or dragons or anything outside of Pixie Hollow. Um, I assume this was down to budget because if you have each film in the same central location, you can make a lot of them. And that's why they were able to make them every single year. Whereas for a book, you're only limited to your imagination. The Pirate Fairy is kind of the one to change that. A new character called Zarina is introduced to us, amazed by the magic of pixie dust, doing all sorts of forbidden experiments that left her outcast from society. So she flies away and becomes a pirate captain instead. When Tink and friends follow Zarina, they're cursed so that their talents have been sought from one another. So Tinkerbell becomes a water fairy, fawn, a light fairy, etc. This is definitely one of the best movies. It does its own thing and has a distinct concept, while being able to expand on the way Pixie Hollow works, give every character something to do and genuine screen time, while introducing one of the most interesting new characters to the series. It has more exciting adventure elements than the others with a ton of action, as it includes human pirates. It ties in with the original Peter Pan more as it features Neverland, some variation of TikTok the Crocodile, and a younger Captain Hook, voiced by Tom Hiddleston, who would become the film's twist villain of sorts. I personally would have preferred if it was less about referencing and calling back to the original movie, and more about doing its own thing in that world. I also find the pirate crew to be kind of annoying, but the new setting is fun. It has cool concepts, and I loved seeing more of the side characters. By the end of the film, all is made up and Zarina is welcomed back into Pixie Hollow, where she can become a part of the franchise's merchandising. They even made one of those Disney limited edition crazy expensive dolls for this film. B for best Tinkerbell film. Probably. Ladies, 
say hello to Gruff. Here we are for the last time, Tinkerbell and the Legend of the Never Beast. This capped off the visual content for this decade long world. And again, I liked this one. It's not as grand as the Pirate Fairy, and it is so frustrating to see so many new characters introduced in these newer films, only to not show up again. Periwinkle was only given a cameo in Pirate Fairy, and Zarina is nowhere to be seen in this film. The focus of this movie is Fawn, an animal fairy who goes through great lengths to protect creatures. Even though they went back to the Tinkerbell title, this was the only film not to have her as its protagonist, which was definitely a welcome change. If they continued on, it would have been a fun direction to see everyone else get their own story. One day, Fawn hears a loud roar coming from the forest, which turns out to be a huge creature known as a Never Beast, who she names Gruff and grows attached to, developing a sweet relationship. The only issue is that in ancient fairy lore, the Never Beast is said to be a creature that wakes every 1,000 years to transform into a vicious beast that will destroy Pixie Hollow. Does this count as lore? I feel like this is not a key role to the universe. A new fairy called Nyx is the villain, and she sees Gruff as a threat, where Fawn sees him as friendly. The argument is presented as two-sided, but ultimately Gruff doesn't destroy Pixie Hollow, but has to say farewell to Fawn at the end. The implications of this message could be kind of problematic, because what if Fawn ends up being wrong? Should we all blindly follow our heart at the risk of great danger, when Nyx was clearly trying to protect out of love? Obviously, Obviously, Gruff is super cute in the film, but it's known that creatures like this can be a danger to fairy kind. Over the years, the animation has definitely improved, and the animals are well designed, and Gruff is brought to life. It's another Tinkerbell film. It's cute, it's cosy, I think it had a fairly strong emotional core, but it just didn't do much to finish the franchise. And it fell back into the traps of being nice, but a little bit generic. L for leaving me wanting a little bit more but having a lot of sweet character moments. And that, after six films, is the end of the Disney Fairies, Pixie Hollow, Tinkerbell cinematic universe. Before I get more into this tragic downfall, there's one more important part of this series I want to delve into. As a kid, I was obsessed with online virtual world games, or MMOs. I'm talking Club Penguin, Pop Tropica, Animal Jam, any game that I could spend hours just walking around in or customising characters, going on quests and chatting with other players. While this was a trend, Disney wanted their own piece of the virtual world pie, so they released Toontown, Pirates of the Caribbean Online, and in 2008, Pixie Hollow, the online world of the Disney fairies. It basically followed the formula as you'd expect. You could customise your own fairy character with different skin, face, hair and wing combinations, which in later updates include the ability to choose a Sparrow Man. You could then choose your fairy talent, albeit the selection was limited to the main ones, so unfortunately no knowing when a dish is done talent. From there, you could navigate worlds based on the four seasons, where you'd be surrounded by other players you can chat with and add as friends. Highlights on social aspects meant a lot of the appeal was unlocking new clothes and furniture for your home that could be earned by collecting materials and playing various minigames, like Bubble Bounce, Harvest Hustle, Snowflake Sweep, and Pinecone Pop, to name a few. The only catch was, of course, that most features were locked behind a premium membership fee. If you wanted the coolest clothes or the best rewards, you had to pay up, which, like a lot of these online communities, created a kind of class divide. Non-members were seen as poor and less than, so if you wanted to be cool and experience the game fully, you had to beg your parents to pay an ongoing fee. This business model was used with mostly all of these kind of games, which today has more or less shifted to endless pay-to-win microtransactions, which is even worse in my opinion. But later on, the game would introduce diamonds, a premium currency, and updates would lock features previously for all players behind a paywall, such as the ability to have multiple fairies on your account. This game in general does look really cute and fun. The backgrounds have a beautiful art style and the soundtrack is really lovely. I think the appeal is less so the gameplay and more the experience, if that makes sense. You felt like a part of the world and there was a community to interact with. The game had frequent events which furthered the real-time immersive aspect, including fairy versions of Valentine's and Halloween, with seasonal items 
items and unlocks. And there was just a huge player base that created a bustling community to make friends with each other. And other typical shenanigans found in these games, like fashion shows, adoptions and parties, as well as an array of early 2010s online content such as Pixie Hollow music videos, let's plays and more. Also, a lot of the series' toys would include special gifts that could be unlocked in Pixie Hollow, and a special line was released called Clickables. These included a handheld game similar to Tamagotchi and many friendship charms and bracelets that were said to unlock special features. I sadly never played Pixie Hollow in its prime, but I know how much I would have loved this game, but I also know how sad I would have been when it shut down. In summer 2013, Disney announced a shutdown of all the game's servers, as well as its other online MMOs. For its last moments, all players were granted free membership before years of memories faded away. Disney stated the reasoning was to focus more on mobile gaming, even though they also shut down the mobile dress-up game tie-in. Even though it closed, the community would attempt to keep Pixie Hollow alive. A fan revival project called Fairy ABC launched shortly after the closure. It runs through a hidden link in this online forum. The whole thing seems very inactive and primitive. The game can be run and you can still create your fairy, but the gameplay itself is glitchy, laggy and incomplete. It's also very, very dead. Another revival project began in 2018 called We The Pixies, which is still in active development now, with plans to recreate the game for free and even add original content. It doesn't work in full, only one minigame has been added and it has limited features, but you can still create a fairy and fly around to really of that magic, even if it is somewhat buggy. This one got popular online around 2020. There's currently an active Discord community with many players and events, so it's really one of the best places to relive Pixie Hollow online now. With Pixie Hollow now closed and the films coming to an end, Disney fairies would fade into nothingness. Legend of the Never Beast was their lowest grossing film, which is likely why they didn't continue to make more. However, plans did exist for future Tinkerbell movies. Tinker Academy is believed to be a scrapped film that would have taken on a steampunk aesthetic that sees Tinkerbell attend a prestigious school for tinkers. Little is known about this movie and if it was even in production at all. It could have just been a short or something like that as opposed to a feature film. There does exist concept art that showed the distinct designs and styles we could have seen, as well as character design sheets. These are some of the most interesting designs in the entire franchise. This guy has a prosthetic arm. I I just want to know more about them all. A full five minute storyboard of the film's opening, complete with voice acting, a logo and early animatics can be viewed, showing Fairy Mary excited to go off to Tinker Academy, only to be stopped by a new arrival. This is what confuses me. Supposedly these events are taking place during the first Tinkerbell movie, but I'm assuming it was a prologue, as Mary alludes to training Tinkerbell to go to Tinker Academy in the future. I don't know about you, but I think we were absolutely robbed of this idea because it had potential to have the most distinct aesthetic and style, but we never got it. And I'm kind of mad about that, Disney. Even though there were no films in production, Disney tend to be good at keeping their past productions alive, what with theme parks, merchandising and general brand recognition. But Disney fairies began to slip away and became a product of its time. Tinkerbell is back to being her own thing and Disney are more focused on her than any other fairy characters. In recent years, I've seen a lot of fans call for a reboot or a revival of some sort, and with Disney Plus focusing a lot of its efforts on pandering to nostalgia through reboots, I can't rule it out completely. But the studio Disney Toon that made the films eventually closed down, so don't expect a new film anytime soon. I'm glad this franchise existed, and it was really cozy getting to revisit it. Let me know all of your experiences with the Disney fairies in the comments below. Which film was your favourite? Did you ever play the games? Did you have any merchandise? If you want more content like this on random things that interest me from the past, there's some similar videos on screen to check out now, and subscribe to not miss the next upload. Keep spreading love and hopefully you'll see me in my little corner of the world again soon.